Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our evening service. We're going to begin with the song, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? Now that you're comfortable in our new seats, uh, you can stand and we'll, st and we'll st uh, sing this together. Are You Washed in the Blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood? Just open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're able to sing that and we're able to sing that our uh, sins have been washed as white as snow because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just want to thank you for that. Uh, we thank you, Father, that we can come and be able to worship you this evening, be able to worship you in song. And then as the, um, as the, the, the word is, your word is preached, um, we just uh, pray that we'd be able to worship you in that way as well in listening to you uh, through your word. And through your servant, Brother Michael, as he brings uh, your word to us this evening. May it uh, be a blessing and also a challenge, Father, to our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. We also pray, Father, for Pastor as he's uh, preaching at um, Oasis Baptist, I believe. We just ask that you would help him and empower him with your spirit to bring your word um, boldly to that congregation there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, we'll go with the announcements. So our regular uh, services, as you know, 10 a.m. Uh, and 6 p.m. and in the evening, if you are able to make it, uh, 5.30 prayer time. Click. Uh, okay. Yes, brother. Uh, no, not that I not that I know of. I, yes, I don't think there is. Um, Pastor hasn't said anything to to me or anything, so no. Um, so yeah, no Good Friday service, okay? Enjoy the hot cross buns and all those type of things if you wish to have that. And chocolate, it's a good excuse to have chocolate, right? Not, anyway, we won't get into that. All right, let's go to the next one. Um, no, sorry, uh, brother, yep, that's it. Prayer time on Mondays if you're able to make it 1.30 uh, in the afternoon. All right, click. Yep, Wednesday, um, uh, we have a Bible study on the Book of Romans at one o'clock. Uh, we have young adults uh, with Brother Torrin, who leads that and is able to uh, do a Bible study uh, with the young adults there. Uh, outreach, as you all know, at 10.30, so meeting here on Saturday mornings at 10.30. If you can, you can go with the Greg Ricks and Pastor and anybody else who comes. There's the Bible study, Bible school. 
there's several outings. So there's the women's one there on the 4th of April. Uh, then I believe there's uh, other ones that will be coming up soon. Uh, the youth group, uh, Friday, this, uh, is it this Friday? Oh, no, not this Friday, obviously not. Uh, it's Easter, following Friday. Um, we have a youth group. Uh, another outing. So I think it's Sister Katerina, I think. Is that her name? Um, so just, if ladies, if you uh, wish to go see her when she, she sits here in the morning. That's why I'm pointing that way. Um, so uh, see her if you wish to go and um, a, a, on these outings. All right, next one. Yes, the youth camp. Uh, this is exciting. We have about, I think, 15 youth signed up already. Um, and probably others uh, that will possibly be signed up and also some day visitors. Um, so that's going to be an exciting time. Uh, the Greg Ricks and the Vellas have been uh, putting in a lot of work and effort and um, Ash and I are just tagging along just because. Um, but uh, it's just going to be a really good time. Uh, pray for us because um, it's going to be, yeah, it's just going to be a good time. But it's also be able to, um, for us to be able to share the word with the young people um, and for our future generation. Um, so just pray for that. That'll be the youth camp there. Um, another outing. Wow, we do a lot of outings in this church. It's fantastic. Um, anyway, so con contact Brother Don if you wish to go to that outing. Um, the next one there, Brother. Yep, okay, the NBF. Yep, so we have the fellowship meetings. Um, this is, a, yeah, something to look forward to. Obviously, the seat that you are sitting on, as Pastor mentioned this morning, may, you may be the first person to be sitting on that. Probably not because there was a lot of people here this morning. Um, but yes, so these are the new seats and we have plenty more as well, according to Pastor. Uh, so these are the seats that we're going to use for the fellowship meetings because we're going to host them at uh, Blake's Crossing Christian School and hopefully their gymnasium will be finished by then. Um, <laughs> And uh, we'll be able to put these seats in there. We also were able to acquire a new piano. Um, well, I mean, it's not brand new, but it's a, it's a newer piano. So um, we were able to uh, purchase that, which is fantastic. Um, so now we have that as well to be able to use. So it's been a blessing all around. Um, and the Lord has been able to bless us, bless the church with these uh, new things as well. All right. And yep, just continue to register. You can go and register yourself and, you know, tell other people about it as well. And I think that's everything. Great. All right. Let's continue with our singing um, with holy, holy, holy. Let's stand once again and we'll sing this together, please.
Trinity. Amen. You may be seated. I want to get also, if you are visiting with us or you haven't visited us in a while, welcome. Uh, I'd like to extend your wel- uh, welcome to you as well. All right. Our next song will be How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. We've sung this before, um, but some of you may not be familiar with it, and that's okay. For those of you who do know it, sing it out. And uh, during this song, Brother Rodney, if you could, could collect the offering, that would be fantastic. Thank you. All right. How beautiful heaven must be. If we can go to the first stanza there, Brother Jacob, that would be really good. Yeah, excellent. singing a special right there. Um, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, let's go back out to the first stanza. Thanks, Jacob. Um, now that you know the melody, follow follow the melody that Ash is playing. Don't follow my voice because I kind of fluctuate every now, every now and then. Um, but yes, just follow that and we'll give it another, um, another shot. On the first fan, stanza. We read of a place that's called hell. Keep going, you keep going. <laughs> the there shining, how beautiful.
that we're, when we get up there, we're, we're going to be able to sing properly, and I'll be, I'll be glad for that, and we'll be able to, you know, make no mistakes, but that's good. Thank you. Thank you for singing that. Brother Michael, come for the message. Thanks, Brother Joel. And the beauty of the heaven is really be because of the one who is actually enthroned in there, our Lord, our Holy Lord. For the preaching tonight... Um, our passage is found on 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. Let us pray first. Lord, we are grateful again for this wonderful time of rest that you, we have in you, that we are all gathered again together in this evening, O oh Lord, and to, that we can uh, behold your glory again through your word. We are grateful, O oh Lord, for the precious words that you have before us, an inspired word, an inerrant word, and tonight as we study, a sufficient word for us. We pray, Lord, that you will open our eyes, that we may behold the wondrous things out of your law today. Be with us, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The word of God, it is sufficient. It is sufficient. Today we are concluding our series that we have started a few, few months ago as a short series, really, a three-part series on the Word of God. It is a doctrinal series. It is meant for us to be uh, taught by the basics of this uh, Christian principle, the Word of God. On the first week, we describe the Word of God as inspired. The Word that you are holding on at this point in time is the inspired word of God. It means that it comes from our Lord. Yes, he may have used agency of men, but ultimately the author of this very word is our very Lord. But also secondly, we discussed last time the inerrancy and infallibility of the scripture. The words that you are holding on at this point in time, the, there is no error, there is no mistake. Therefore, we can always rely upon his word. Tonight now, we are going to study a very important topic that will have a particular application, hopefully, on our doctrinal uh, framework, but also on our Christian living as well. It is the doctrine of the sufficiency of the word of God. Your Bible is enough to answer the very questions that we need in order for us to go to heaven. Your Bible that you're holding on at this time is enough to, for you to know something about the true God of heavens and the earth. This is something that we will discuss this evening. So let us jump in now to our text, which is really the basis of our meditation in the last uh, three sessions. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. My preaching today is outlined into two parts. Number one, we will look at sufficiency of the scripture as it was demonstrated in this particular passages. But also, secondly, the second half will be the sufficiency of the scripture further defined, affirmed, and we will further look at some of the applications of that. So two headings for you uh, this evening. I pray that this will be a productive session for each and every one of us. So let's jump in now to our uh, first heading, the sufficiency of the scriptures demonstrated. The sufficiency of the scriptures demonstrated. Look at let us look at again and read verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Look at this here. We can look at and notice and observe, number one, a reminder of its profitability. A reminder of its profitability. 
We discussed on verse 16, by the way, all scripture is given by inspiration. We, we had a, a, a whole session of that, so I suggest that you go back to that particular lecture. I am moving on to now on the next bit, the next phrase, and it's profitable, profitable. Look at this. We are reminded of the profitability of the scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Profitable here means that it is, a, it is helpful, it is serviceable, it is advantageous for, for us, for each and every one of us. What does it mean, though? What does it mean? Number one, we can look at the, the meaning of this, that it has a value. It has a value. Every part of the scripture is used by our Lord. Every word in, our, in the Bible that you, we are holding on at this point in time is valuable. We have many examples, of the, many examples of the people who are convicted by the word of God. Sometimes with the use of a simple verses, simple phrases. If you know Spurgeon, for example, when he was unconverted, he was uh, going through a Wesleyan church in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a winter time, and the pastor wasn't there, really, okay? And someone was called in and say, hey, brother, can you preach the word of God? And he was preaching on Isaiah, and, and probably he is, he is uh, a bit intimidated. He doesn't know how to preach, but he has to preach anyway. And he was preaching on a particular passage that says, look upon the Lord. Look upon the Lord. But here, it, it seems like at that point in time, the, the preacher is like, uh, it's like, uh, it's, it, he's probably similar to me now, like, uh, uh, I am faltering in my sentences. He doesn't know what to say. But he's keep, he keeps on repeating and saying, look upon the Lord, look upon the Lord. And the young man, Spurgeon here, was converted, and he understands that he simply needs to look upon the Lord. Oh, dear brothers, oh, dear sisters, every word in the scriptures that you have is valuable. It has value and profitable for your life. Every word in the scripture is enough to convert each and every soul to call upon our Lord. Every soul is, every passage in this word will be enough to carry you until glory. It is enough. The Bible that you are holding on is profitable. It is enough. It has value. Look at this as well. So we look at Spurgeon. Another sample would be Augustine, for example. Augustine, he was, he was converted. He was looking at the, uh, the passage on, on Romans chapter 13 or 14 upon the provision of the flesh. He was reading through it. He's like, uh, he doesn't understand it. But upon, upon reading through the works of Roman, of, of, of Paul in the letter of Roman, Romans, he was converted. It was converted. It has value. The word of God is profitable. It has value. And how many times we have proven this time and time again on our lives? How many times have we encountered various trials and sufferings? How many times we are really, our back is, 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 is at the wall and we can't do anything, but we hold upon the word of God. How many times that we are lonely and we call upon the promises of our Lord that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us. How many times that we have nothing in our hands, yet when we trust upon the Lord, we realize that we have everything that we need in this world, our Lord himself. This word that you're holding on at this point in time is valuable, valuable. Commentator Barnes said it this way, there is no portion of it, even part, the, if, there's no portion of it, even now, which may not be fitted in certain circumstances to furnish us valuable lessons, and consequently, no part of it which could be spared from the sacred canon. There is no part of the human body which is not useful in its place, and no part of which can be spared without sensible loss. The point here that we're saying here is every part of the scripture has value. It's profitable for you. But also notice here, it, it also means not only that it has value, but also it is helpful. It is helpful. It is useful. It is useful for you. We can gain something out of, out of the whole uh, scripture. It is profitable, as mentioned, in times of trials. 
that we can call upon our Lord, that we can trust in Him. But also it is profitable in times of your own prosperity too, that we should humble ourselves before God, that we must understand that everything comes from our Lord. It is profitable in times of loneliness, knowing that we have our Lord. But it is also profitable in times of joy, because we know that it is the Lord himself that will give us joy. It has proven itself to be profitable for those who just really glance over the scripture. And maybe I, I want to challenge you, really. Are you just really just glancing over the scripture? And it will be profitable to you. But how much more if you actually dig deep to the very word of God? It is profitable for the young Christian. Young Christian. Young Christian. You have nothing to read but the word of God. And it's profitable as well for those who are mature and old in the faith. You have nothing but the very word of God as well. It is enough. It is sufficient for you. <clears throat> Martin Luther said it this way. The Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lay holds on me. I wonder. I wonder how, how firm how firm the hold of scripture is in your very hand, in your life at this point in time. Is it holding on you like very lightly? And when you, when you, tr when you are in, in a, a particular trial, you just don't know what to, what to say because you are not reading the word of God. Oh, I, I encourage you, dear brothers. I'm not, I'm not meant to, uh, to keep you down, but I'm meant to encourage you. Read the word of God. You have everything that you need in this very word of God. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, you cannot be in a condition that the word of God has not provided. You cannot be in a place where the word of God will not amply supply you with anything. The word has many faces and eyes as providence itself. You will find it unfailing in all periods of your life, in all circumstances, in all companies, in all trials, and under all difficulties. And cruelty. Oh, brothers, dear sisters, in time, sometimes in times of trial, we, try, we, we throw away everything. But I pray that in your own times of trial, that you will hold on and cling on to the word of God. It will be enough for you to sustain you. So a reminder of its profitability. Look at now. Secondly, a reminder of its utility, its use. Utility. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So in what sense then the scripture is profitable? In four sense. And how can we use this? In, in four ways, as, you, as very obvious here in the, our passage. Number one, it is for doctrinal teaching. Number two, it is for the refutation of error. Number three, it is for correction. And number four, it is for discipleship training, as you can see on verse 16. Let's look at this. Number one, for doctrinal teaching. All scripture is profitable for doctrine. Uh, one commentator said it this way. All great and important doctrines of religion necessary to be known in order to salvation are there taught and more clearly and fully than elsewhere with an authority and influence to be found in no other writings. Do you want to know about true and correct doctrine? Uh, this morning, Pastor was telling us and exhorting us to, to uh, contend for the faith which was uh, given to us. And that faith that was given to us is here in this word. But we must know. We must know what we must contend for. We must know the correct doctrine. Correct doctrine then is found on our scripture. One ancient document here that tell us, Christian document says it, says it this way for us, the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary are explicitly mentioned in this particular book. Here in the Word of God, we can build our theology here in, our, in the word of God, we can know about our Lord. Look, 
we, we have many, many errors that are all about us, all around us, oh, many. And you can, you can categorize them, you can put them on a spectrum, but all of them are errors, heresies, and apostasies. But if you want to know the correct and true doctrine, it is found in this word alone. If you want to know about God, then look at the Bible. And the Bible explicitly mentioned about our Lord. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning, who was there? God created the heavens and the earth. If you want to know about salvation, we then we know the way to, the self, to, a, a, to a, a safe life through our Lord. John 14 verse 6 says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to me, unto the, no one come unto the Father, but by true Jesus Christ, through our Lord. And maybe I'm speaking to you and you are like a visitor here or you have been attending the church, but you don't have any sense of salvation at all. When you talk about saved, well, what do you mean? Saved from what? Saved from whom? Uh, I, I encourage you, I, look up, I, I encourage you to look upon the word of God, to study it upon the word of God, and there you will see the correct path of salvation. It is through our Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. You know what? That's my prayer personally is that we all, as a church, we will all be robust in theology, grounded upon a careful and meditative and a, a passionate exegesis of the Bible that produce sound and good hermeneutics. How wonderful would that be that when you can, you can just pluck out anyone from, the, from, from these people in this new chair here and say, can you tell us about the inspiration of God? And he will explain to us simply and powerfully those great doctrines of the Bible when you say, when you just call someone, hey, can you tell us about salvation and, and justification by faith alone? Can, and, and he will proclaim to you and, and mention all the important details of saving faith through Jesus Christ alone. Oh, I, I, my prayer, my prayer that this congregation, that in one way, in one form, that every one of you will become theologian and every one of you will be grounded by the truth of God so that just like John Bunyan, when you, when you, when your, when, your, when your arm is cut, blood will not flow. But the very word of God itself. Oh, I pray. And that's just my prayer. I, but hopefully that will be your conviction to each and every one of you. If you want to know about doctrine, if you want to know about bibliology, uh, theology proper, Christology, ecclesiology, eschatology, anthropology, and all, all those important matters of theology, brothers, sisters, you have no other textbook. This is your book. This is your book alone. The point is this, is this, that the Bible alone will be enough for us to understand what we needed to know in any matters of the important doctrine of Christianity. Application for, for, for me as a teacher and, and preachers and for, for, for those who will have the opportunity to teach as well. You have one book to preach, brother. You have one book to study in your life. Preach the word. Preach the word. An application for you, congregation. You have one book to study. You have one book to meditate. It is the very word that you are holding on at this point in time. Oh, how I love the Bible. I know you love the Bible too. And how, how many times you've just glanced through it, really. And you can see the wonder of it all, and just simple verse, and it just, it, it just gives you so much that you have never seen before. But sometimes you have, you've read it again, and again, and again. Oh, it's just because of the depth of the very word that you're holding on to now, but also the simplicity as well, that even you young boys, young girls, can actually understand the word of God itself. So, Utility, number one, it is for doctrinal teaching. Number two, it is for refutation of error. Refutation of error. The word here connotes that the Bible is able to convict us, especially especially we, if we are in error, and primarily in doctrinal error here. We will look at the uh, error in terms of our uh, life later. It is profitable, secondly, for reproof. 
Again, error is everywhere in our land. Heresy abounds and sound doctrine is being preached in the pulpits. How do we know that they are wrong? Well, because we have the word of God that acts as our ruler. That, God, that the word of God that set, us, that set for us the correct uh, principle. How do we rebuke them? How do we reprove them? Or how do we re uh, correct them? Again, brothers and sisters, it is through the word of God. It is not through careful or, you, you know, like I call that sometimes a theological gymnastics so that you can arrive at a particular doctrine. No, it is through a careful, simple exegesis of the word of God. And even us too. And I challenge you, you, you too. We, we, who has here perf has a, a complete, perfect doctrine? I mean, so sometimes we can be incorrect in some matters too. Is that correct? And it, sometimes it comes with humility that I may not have seen this particular passage this way. But the word of God is able to reprove you as well with all humility that you should accept it too. So secondly, its utility is for refutation of error. Doctrinal teaching, refutation of errors. Thirdly, it's for correction or amendments in our conduct. Amendments in our conduct, correction in our conduct. The Bible is also able to correct us in our way of life, able to correct us and bring us back into the straight paths of righteousness. Some of us may be struggling with different sins. Pick up the Bible and read and amend your lives as described to us in the scripture. The Bible is filled with uh, principles on how we should live and conduct ourselves as pilgrims in this world. Are we struggling with worldliness? Maybe that's your struggle. Well, the Bible has something for you. Matthew 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust do corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Maybe some of you are struggling with unhealthy anxiety. Well, the Bible has words for you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of its soul. Maybe you have no joy in your life. Well, the Bible has words for you too. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord. I say again, rejoice in the Lord. Do you feel that you cannot trust anyone? Well, the Bible has words for you. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord and lean, uh, trust in, in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on your own understanding. Are you struggling with lust? Matthew 18, verse 9 says, if, you, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. Are you struggling with anger? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Well, you have the words of God. My point here is, you have the words of God for every situation that you need. So, utility, utility in correction. Lastly now, discipleship. We can use this in our discipleship as to, look at this, profitable for instruction in righteousness. The Bible gives us the complete package for us to be a true disciple of Christ. When you, when you, when you, are, when you, when you become regenerated and you're converted, and the Lord says, you, well, this is your manual. This is everything that you need to know about me. This is everything that you need to study. This is the path that you're going. It's all in this book. It is enough. It is sufficient book for, for us, for everyone who starts as Christianity, and for those who are going there, and for those who has been there for many years. It's a, it's, in a way, it's an instruction manual for us. Things to study is just right here in the Word of God. And again, it's a challenge for the new disciples. Read the book. Read the book. Read the Bible. And Michael, will, how, what, where shall I start? Read from beginning to the end. Start from Genesis all the way there. Read, consume it, devour it. It has everything that you need to know. I'm working in a new company now. Uh, obviously, I'm just tiptoeing on everything. And they have two... It's probably like three documents that I need to know by heart. They said, this is my Bible. Uh, to be honest with you, I memorize all of that. Okay, This is what I will be doing. In, in case oh, there is a particular things that will happen, this is what I'm going to do. If something happens this way, this is what I'm going to do. If I need to escalate it, okay, this is what I, who, who I need to call. Oh, brothers, oh, sisters, I have devotedly follow that. Oh, how much more? to matters of eternal life. 
you have everything in this word of God. So, as you can see here, the utility, a reminder of its utility for doctrinal teaching, for ref refutation of error, for correction, and for discipleship training. Look at this. I want to I wanna look at briefly and mention Psalm 19, verse 7 to 10. Look at the, how sufficient the word of God is for everything. Psalm 19, verses 7 to 10. The law of the Lord is perfect. It converts a soul. It converts a soul. The testimony of the Lord is, is sure, making wise the simple. Have you been to a, in a situation where you, it seems like you're making the wrong choice every day of your life? Go back to the word of God. It will, make the wise, it will make wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yet than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb challenge for you is this. Do you desire them more than anything? Do you desire the word of God more than anything? Do you consume them? Do you consume this word of God every day of your life? So a reminder of its utility, a reminder of its profitability. Lastly now, a reminder of its ability. A reminder of its ability. Verse 17, that the man of God, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in, unto all good works. Notice to whom this verse is addressed. Number one, look at this. It is addressed to the man of God. Well, on this particular context, the man of God is obviously here uh, uh, people like Timothy, the pastors, the elders of the church. Okay, The words of God is enough for a man of God to be perfect, totally furnished unto all good works. The man of God in the Bible are the messengers of God. So Paul is saying here that Timothy, you need the word of God. This is the very last letter of, T of Paul. But Paul is telling Timothy, uh, I'm not giving you anything but the word of God. Preach the word of God. Man of God, this is everything that you need to know. Perfect, totally furnished and into everything. So in that sense, pastors, teachers, preachers should need this word of God, if they want to remain a man of God. But also second sense as well, it is also for the man of God. That means for us too, in general sense. If we want to be a man after God's own heart, to be the people of God, we need the Bible. The man of God are the man of the word. Or the, or the woman of God are, 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 is a woman of the word. Okay, so we can see here to whom this verse is addressed. But notice here the furnishing, furnishing given to us. Verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished. Perfect here means that uh, the, 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 so that the man of God may be perfect, meaning it will, that the man of God may be complete. We have the full volume of everything that we need. Pastors, teachers, preachers, you have everything that you need. Here, from Genesis to Revelation, nothing more, nothing less. If you're going to preach, pastors, teachers, preachers, you have nothing to open but the word of God. It's furnished and totally furnished for us. You have all the tools that you need to follow. You have every weapon in the armory in a way to withstand uh, the enemy. You have all the map, the coordinates, the signs, the warnings as we travel from earth to glory. We are fully equipped. We are amply supplied. We are provisioned. Sufficient is the word of God. But notice here, not only to whom this verse is addressed, not only the furnishing it gives, but also the aim of this. What's the aim? That's, what's the aim? That the, so that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works, unto all good works. Notice here, it is not some good works, but to all, all good works. Everything that you need to do as a man of God and you as a man of God in general. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he had before ordained that we should walk in them. 
for all good works. That's the aim of this. So hopefully you have a bit of a understanding now of the sufficiency of the scriptures as it is demonstrated very quickly now. I would like to go through some bits and pieces about how we can define the sufficiency of the scriptures, some maxims and principles here. I would like to go to some of the affirmations, some of the affirmations here. This doctrine affirms, number one, this doctrine affirms the absolute sufficiency of the scriptures in matters of faith and conduct. This doctrine affirms the absolute sufficiency of the scriptures in anything that is concerning faith in everything that concerns our conduct. Remember the one hymn? If, uh, I don't know if you, if you may remember this. How firm a foundation. How firm a foundation. How firm a foundation, O saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in His excellent word. What more can He say than to you He has said? Who unto the Savior for refuge He have fled? Well, the point was saying, if, if you need to know anything about the faith, if you need to know anything about how to, co to conduct yourself in, in a Christian way as, you, as pilgrims in this world, what more can he say than to you? He has already said it to you in his word. So look at these matters of faith, what we need to know about God, what we need to believe about the Bible, what we need to believe about church and right doctrine, what we need to believe about sin and salvation as well. What we need to know about coming eternal life. But also here, what we need to do. Matters of conduct as well. How should we live in perspective of the, of the future? How then should we conduct our souls? So doc this doctrine affirms the absolute sufficiency of the scriptures in matters of faith and conduct. Number two, this doctrine affirms the absolute authority of the word of God over and above any person, counsel, creed, or confession. Do you understand what I'm saying here? We have the word of God here, and it is over, above, everyone. Do you understand? If everything that we, know, we need to know is in the Bible, then whether it is the pastor or an angel, whether a creed old or new, if they are contrary to the word of God, then we follow scripture rather than man, rather than man. Oh, I think this generation need man of the word of God. I think this, this world, oh, this Adelaide, this, this town in South Australia actually need more man of God who trembled not against man, not against any council, not against anyone, but who trembled upon the word of God. Oh, I pray, I pray that in the future or even now that the Lord will raise up many men of God who has no yes, sir, only upon the word of God alone. Oh, pray with me. Oh, dear church, that we may pray that we, the Lord will raise up more men of God who has, has not, is not afraid of anything. I remember John Knox. John Knox is a small man. He's a small man and you... <laughs> Uh, if you see him, you will not be afraid of him. And even Queen Mary says, like, oh, I'm not afraid of John Knox, but when he preached, when he prays, I am afraid of him. Oh, dear church. Oh, dear church for you. I pray that many people will be afraid of us because we have the word of God. And when we preach, we preach with sincerity. We preach with true humility, but we preach with authority coming from the word of God. So we have no other authority. There's no book above the Bible. There's no person above the Bible. It is our absolute authority. Thirdly, now, this doctrine affirms that no further revelation is necessary. No further revelation is necessary. If it's sufficient, then it is enough. It is enough. We must not tamper upon the word of God. Everything that we know, we need to know is here. Everything that portrays any addition, revision, or further revelation is a false doctrine. Look at this. Remember again, look at this. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Perfect, complete, totally furnished, that the man of God may be complete, perfect. Everything that he needs to know is in this word. 
So hopefully some affirmations there, a few more, some clarifications as well. I, I know this might some, uh, this whole thing might uh, add some few questions on you, but some clarifications here. This doctrine does not deny the fact that we need pastors, teachers, preachers, and the church. Okay, we have absolute sufficiency of the scripture, but it does not deny the fact that we still need teachers, pastors, preachers. Teachers are gifts from God, so we can have further clarification on the word of God. It is not telling us to be a lone ranger Christian with the Bible on your own, living uh, secluded in a place. No, this uh, it encourages us to sharpen one another so are we are fully trained upon the word of God and as a community, we learn the precious thoughts of God as found in the word together. Secondly, this doctrine does not deny the fact that we need tools to help us to understand the word of God. The Bible is sufficient. The Bible is inspired. It is inerrant, but not everything is plain. Okay? There are plain things in the word of God. There are things that are very clear, but there are things that are not so clear for us too. So we need some tools to understand the word of God. There are difficult passages, and some of you who has preached and are as teachers, sometimes you are afraid of preaching some of those passages too, and you, we cower, and it, it's hard to preach those, those difficult passages, but we must employ all necessary tools for us to understand the Bible. We can read commentaries, uh, concordances, etc., so we can grasp the sense of the Bible. Thirdly, now, this doctrine does not tell us anything about sciences, arts, literature, and history. Okay? It is not a science textbook. It is not a literature textbook. It is not a, it, there is history in it, but this is not the world history as uh, portrayed in a textbook. Okay? But anything that pertains to your faith, anything that pertains to your conduct, we have everything in the word of God. So as we end now, some application for us. The Bible is sufficient. It's sufficient for you. Sufficient for us. We can rely upon the word of God as it is enough for our spiritual needs. In preaching, our application for preaching, in preaching, the pastors, teachers, preachers, give us the word. Give us the word. Preach the word. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. In worship as well, be exhorted by the word. Be exhorted by the word. And, and uh, Brother Joel has mentioned this particular hymn that I really, really love. His robes were mine, for example. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cause. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God, bought by such love. But my life is not my own. My praise, my all shall be for Christ alone. Oh, that is enough to fuel my devotion, really. Just, just this, this word, I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. God, strange from God. So in worship, be exhorted by the word. In ministry, be guided by the word. Be guided by the word. There are many extra, extra biblical things and, and methodologies that many uh, churches or organizations are employing. Oh, we don't need that. We need a pulpit, a word of God, and a preacher. And that is enough. And that is enough. In your daily struggles, do you find the word of God to be sufficient refuge as well? Oh, you have everything here. You're fully furnished. Lastly, now, there's no further revelation. But what is fully given to you is given in your hand. Is given in your hand. You have dear church. You have dear church. The very word of God. It is a sufficient word of God. Read it. It's your responsibility now. Devour it. Consume it. Every day of your life. Oh can I consume it in the first year of my life? Yes. In, in the, when I you know when I become older. And grow mature in my faith. When I you know when I become. <laughs> Uh, after 40 years in Christianity, is this still relevant? Yes. Oh, in my last dying breath, is this still relevant? Yes. Yes. We have the word of God. You have the word of God. Let us pray. Lord, we are just grateful for your word.
it is enough, it is sufficient for all our needs. And uh, truly, as the hymn would say, what more can we say that you have already said, O oh God? And Lord, we pray that whatever we have seen today will be in our hearts to change us so that we may read your word, love it above everything else, and love you above all else, O oh God, because it is you who has spoken this word to us, O oh Lord. Fix our eyes upon you. Be our vision every day of our life. Be the, may, let the word of God dwell in our heart richly, O oh Lord, so that we may not sin against you. Be with us as a church. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Brother Michael. All right, we're going to finish with um, a song that's fitting with what Brother Michael's saying. Um, Christ is sufficient. And he's talking about sufficiency of the Word of God. Well, Christ is the one that is the Word of God there. So Christ is sufficient. Let's stand and we'll sing this song together, please. Nothing I've done could merit God's grace. Nothing and do can take it. We thank you that you are enough and uh, Father you meet every need of ours uh, whatever it may be Father you uh, will meet it and we pray Father that we would um, know in our hearts that you will always be enough that nothing in this earth will satisfy and as we've just um, sung Father that we would drink and be filled and uh, Father that we would be content but that we would desire to yearn for you still. And so, Lord, we just ask that this week we would uh, know the sufficiency of who you are and the sufficiency of your word, that we would be in it every day and be able to be f uh, fed and spoken to you uh, as we read your word. 
Uh, we thank you for this evening. We pray that you'll dismiss us now with your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.